Thanks for joining us today for the next lecture in Sea Alaska Heritage's Fall Lecture Series. Today is uh, one of several free lectures under the theme Language Programs Around Alaska, School-Based Indigenous Language Revitalization Models, and it is promoted through Sea Alaska Heritage's Indigenizing Education for Alaska program. Indigenizing Education for Alaska, or IEA, supports indigenous education through internships for future educators, a community of practice for current educators, as well as college scholarships for students working towards becoming teachers in Alaska. The IEA scholarship provides tuition and housing assistance for UAS students. You can learn more by contacting IEA at coalaska.com. Today's lecture is presented uh, by Ross Jenny Cruz, who is Gunwa Shaw, a child in, in law of the Stuka and a grandchild of the Barak baby. Ross Jenny, originally from Haines, has lived in Juneau since 2001 while learning the Kinkit language. An educator, Ross Jenny has taught all grade groups, but has settled into teaching pre K in the Hayu Kartangi community. A Shingat language nest hosted by Central Council of Quicken Haida. She has led the Hayu Kudi since 2019 and will be sharing the process of opening the nest and keeping it running today. If you're here in the audience, please silence your cell phones and there will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the lecture. Thank you. Chester was her TA. And at that time, there was 
wasn't um, any other classes other than beginning Tlingit. So I, I probably took beginning Tlingit. I, I, I can't even count how many times. I, let's just say that I graduated with my bachelor's degree with 54 credits in Alaska Native language. And again, at that time, there was no Alaska Native languages degrees. There was um, there wasn't really a lot of options. My um, my what's it called advisor was like, I don't think you're going to graduate with a teaching degree um, at the rate you're going, because um, I was trying to get a bachelor's in elementary ed. So I was like, okay, well I'm just going to switch majors, and I switched my major to um, social sciences um, with a minor in Alaska Native Studies. Again, there were no language minors. There were no language bachelor's or associate's degrees, and I did. I went on to get my master's um, degree, and PETA's didn't have to fully support me when I switched to a bachelor's in social sciences, but they did. Um, I think that they just saw my intention. I was already, you know, once you start learning language, they're like, oh, you know some language? Come teach in this school, and come teach in this school, and then come teach in this school. So I was already, by my second year in college, I was already in several classrooms throughout, um, throughout Juneau. So I kind of knew that was the path I was going. I think they could see that the, that was the path I was taking. From there, I really bounced around. I was at Sayyik Elementary School for a few years, teaching thing it there. Really fun programming. I was teaching 250 students weekly. Uh, I think they got a half an hour to 45 minutes of language each week. Started a little dance group there. Uh, really fun, amazing job, but again, it's like, sprinkling, right? We're just sprinkling some nouns out there. We're sprinkling some language out there. Um, and it wasn't till I had my first child, she's almost 10, where a group of us were like, ooh, we're all having babies and maybe we should start like doing something with that. I had, um, they had lot, we had lot, uh, the funding for my job at, at Sayek had ended and so that was right about the time that I had a baby. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just start a language nest or a daycare at my house. And the red tape was pretty crazy trying to start an in-home childcare for me. It just got really overwhelming. Um, also, I live out the road and people were like, well, we don't really want to drive 20 miles to have to drop off our kid for childcare. So there were just all, this, all these challenges I faced. And that was really when Clinkett and Haida approached me um, to start working with them to open a language nest. I even went to Head Start and was like, hey, I'd love to start a language nest. How can we do this? I came to SHI. And again, lots of red tape trying to get my foot in the door to open a language nest. Um, but it wasn't until about 2014 that Tribal Assembly uh, passed a resolution and that was to start language programming through the tribe. And so I think I got hired in 2015, 2016 um, through the tribe. And uh, I was the only, I was the language department. I was literally placed under the business and economic department through Clinkett and Haida because there was nothing like a language department for us at Clinkett and Haida. Um, and it was just a lot of learning for me. I, back to my language journey, when I got my degree, I was like, I'm never teaching below third grade, ever. Just not gonna do it. And now I'm teaching preschool. So don't ever say never, because you never know what you're gonna get into. Uh, so let's see, building up to 2018, 2019, um, we got a space at the VTRC, which is now called Generation Southeast. So I got a classroom in there and I started setting up a classroom and working on just learning the ins and outs of childcare, the ins and outs of state regulations, um, who can I go to for support, AEYC, THREAD. I even started doing my CDA, did all this work for CDA, lots of classes, and then I found out, <gasps> you have a master's degree in education, you don't need a CDA. <laughs> so it was just a lot of learning on my own time and trying to figure things out. And then in 2018, we received, wrote and received the ANA Esther Martinez grant. Um, and it was really, really exciting. 
but we were not licensed as a child care yet. In April of 20, maybe it was March, March, April of 2019, we received our child care license for a child care center, a group home at the time, and then um, moved it to a child care center. And as soon as we got that license, we pushed out applications and we opened the door, even though we were only gonna be open for a month. And so the very first time we ever opened Hayuka Tengi Kuri to uh, a group of students who that was the intention for them to walk into a room and to not hear English from any adults in the space was the spring of 2019. And we were only open for about four to six weeks. Um, fortunately, there was this strong group of us who had been doing language work together, language work with our children, and most of those children applied and got in. And so I think that year we had maybe 10 to 14 students, probably never do that many students again. We'll talk about challenges later on. Um, and a lot of them were our children, so they already had a base of the language. They could be role models to the other children who were coming into the nest, um, who had maybe never had language before. And it was a really, I don't know, just a really strong group. We didn't have a lot of staff at the time, but, but somehow we managed, even with 14 students. Um, and then just last fall, we received another ANA, Esther Martinez grant. It's a five-year grant. And so we are moving into year two right now and really excited. Um, but before we move into the rest of everything, I'm gonna uh, show you just a little bit of pictures this is some of the crew and some of the students that we've had in the nest. You can see a lot of our children in here. Um, prior to opening the nest, we, we were kind of doing grassroots things. We were meeting at the library once a week and it was like on Thursday morning and anybody who could bring their children would bring their children in. And our goal was, okay, let's try to hit like an hour and a half just in the language. And it took us almost all year of meeting every Thursday. By the end of that year, we were finally able to just stay in the language for an hour and a half. And then you go from that to like, hey, we're gonna be with students four hours a day, four days a week, you know, staying in the language. And so just building up that capacity. Um, in the nest, we have we have started trying to integrate cultural values um, as well as trying to meet the needs of three to five year olds. Um, so here um, on the left, you can see our daily schedule. It's all written in the language and we use this to talk to the kids about what's gonna happen throughout the day. Sometimes when kids, the kids, um, get confused or they just want to play or we have new students in there, some of our returning students will let them know, um, no, look up here, it's playtime now. And yes, they're speaking in English, but I've read that in Tlingit over and over and over again. So they understand the language and we'll talk about receptive versus expressive language here in a moment. Um, and on the right, you see a, a photo of our school jobs. Last year was the first time we implemented classroom jobs for our students. Um, part of the problem was that when we tried to create jobs, we tried to get translations for the jobs. Like, okay, this is the kid who's gonna hold the door open and greet the kids and let the kids come in. And those titles were getting really, really, really long. So last fall, I was like, you guys, why don't we use culturally relevant names for our jobs? Okay, so if you are the person who's going to hold the door open, and we ask our kids, they say, is it okay that I come in? So when we're coming in for recess, we give a student a job, it's their job to allow the children to come in. So they wait, hold the door open, the students that want in, they say, is it okay that I go into the school? And that child can say, ah, or kleik, and you know, they only say like if the kid is like, hey, schwasa get ute pizza, hua gudi. Like they'll try to be silly. Um, I'll explain why that's really cool in a moment. Um, and then the guasli is for our drummer. Okay, so the skun, skun sati, kind of the leader of the group. Okay, we have skun wan shade hani, another one. That's the 
another word for leader, right? They're the, they're the leader of the whole class and they get to help during circle time and they help to get to lead that, that programming during circle time. And then we have Nakani and it's the Nakani's job to go around the classroom, and Nakani means in-law, right? We usually hire them at Kuik to help us at our Kuik to make sure things are flowing and functioning. Their job is to go around the classroom and say, Kejin winit uyach, there's five minutes left, or gout kaw kid, it's time, you know, time has come to an end. And so they're the ones who kind of make sure that the class is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, the reason I wanted to say, like, why it's so cool that the kids say, hey, Hwasa get ute pizza, huagu, pizza de huagudi, is because they're knowing what words to switch out. We don't teach them directly that you, you could say, hey, Hwasa get ute hundakehedi de huagudi, hey, Hwasa get ute. You can do all those, but they're learning what word it is that they have to switch out in that sentence to change the sentence about talking about where they're going. Okay, that is so cool. So even though they're being silly and we're going to say, Clay, Sukana'ak, go ahead, try it again, right? Even though we're going to say that to them, in my mind, I'm like, that's so cool because they know how to switch out the words and the nouns in that sentence to create a different sentence. I'm gonna go in a little bit to um, resource creations. So how many of you are learning or teaching language actively? How many of you have been learning and maybe have taught language in the past? Okay. We all know that there are not enough resources in our language our language is for us to use. So we are constantly creating resources, constantly. I mean, that was one of the best things that happened during COVID for our team was, yes, we taught our preschoolers online a couple days a week, but we also created a ton of resources. Some that worked and some that we tried and we were like, oh, that didn't work at all. We find that it's best to be like, oh, we need something for that specific topic and then we can create it. So uh, this first book um, is a book that we created to help um, students understand what our expectations are in the classroom. And we've found that we could really add to this book quite a bit and we haven't yet because we just haven't had the time. But ayachakwa, it just means, is that, is that right? Is that the way it is? And this shows, you'll see here. So we'll ask the kids, can you see that okay? And the kids are gonna say, because look at, those are my yadki, they're up on their heads during circle time. That's not how we behave, right? Try it again. Right? I think we've changed this book since then. We ask again, and they say, ah, and so like right now, this is what we're doing in my classroom. We are reading this book every single day so the kids know, okay, this is how our cubbies should look. We should not be climbing on the side of the fort. We should be using the stairs, right? So I think we should maybe clean up our toys when we're done, okay? I think I didn't know what to expect going into a language nest, but as we keep moving through the years, I'm like, oh, we're not just teaching language. We have three to five-year-olds. This is like a huge shift in helping to form who these children will be as they grow into adults. And so I think for us, that has been a real challenge. I had, um, I remember hearing somebody a long time ago say, it's no good the way you're behaving. And um, I think for us, we're trying to find more positive ways to teach to our children um, that maybe that's not the way we behave, but let's show them how to behave. Let's show them 
what we should do instead. And that's kind of where this book came from, is like, let's show them how to do it. So they had a lot of fun with that. Um, this book was really fun to create. This was when we were coming back from the classroom, or to the classroom after COVID. We came back in, God, uh, 2021, the fall, like maybe November, December. Right, that was, yeah. And we were required to all wear masks. And we all know three to five-year-olds have a hard time wearing masks. And so we used our children to create this book and they had a lot of fun. Oh, wear your mask well. Are you gonna wear it on your chin? Right? We're going to wear it on our nose and our mouth. Are you going to wear it on your forehead? No, try it again. Where I will wear it on my nose and my mouth. Are you going to wear it on your knee? No, try it again. I'm going to wear it on my nose and my mouth. Right? So we went through just creating the, this resource to show kids we did skits with puppets. Costine, my coworker, she made these amazing puppets and so we used those to model mask wearing. Um, and then we talk about like that we want to wear masks correctly so that we don't get other people sick. So that's another resource that we have made. Um, Talk about helping a lot. Mom, let me help you. That's what this book is about. So we're talking about Nani Tsuju is helping her mom. They're cutting fish, right? Kinze is helping her mom. They're cutting moose meat. Gush Dutin is helping his mom. They are drumming. And so trying to introduce these, these verbs and get them familiar with it, teach them about sh the helping one another so I'm just trying to show you guys all the fun resources we've made. As you can see, we use our own children a lot. We're just like, okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna make these resources. Um, I'm gonna show you this one first. So this, we have created an entire alphabet book series as well. So we have, they, they get a little bit more difficult as you go through the series. Not only do the sounds get more difficult, but we end, add sentences rather than just noun words. So like our class right now is working on these. I can tell that most of the kids already know all these nouns now um, that start with Y. And so we'll go to the next book, which I believe is the N book. And we worked with a, a past teacher from Haynes to create like what order we should go in in terms of sound. Um, easy versus difficult sounds. So we've just been going nonstop. <laughs> um, and then this one's a really fun one. I want to show you this because you're going to watch a video in a minute on how we integrate this book. So this comes from, or so we're writing curriculum as well, right? And this comes from our hand washing unit. And so that happens at the very beginning of the year, it especially became really prevalent when, uh, you know, we came back after COVID. So this is all about our handprints. And, you know, each kid will be painting with their hand on paper. And then we make a rainbow every year with all our handprints and we're learning colors. But the important thing is every time they do a handprint, they have to go wash their hands and we sing the hand washing songs. But I bet like about the 10th time we read this book, the kids were like, oh, this book again. You know, they were just kind of like, we're over it. Um, and that's when uh, Yatutin created a song. How many of you are teachers? Lots of you, I see some of you out there. And we know songs, songs work, right? So I'm gonna try to do this without uh, making too loud, loud of a sound next to the mic. I'm stuck to that thing, okay. So, I'm picking blueberries with my hands. And then we go like this. 
Achaya kanet akahini yachya ti achjin i te. And so, my handprint is purple, or like the color of blueberry juice. And we just go on like that. We'll read the phrase, I'm playing in the mud with my hands, and that's why my handprint is brown. I'm playing with snow. And then we have some more culturally relevant things, like I am picking uh, thimbleberries. I'm working on plants. So my hands are, hand prints are green. Painting with my hand. This one's so hard. Ready, you guys? <laughs> that, we always struggle with that phrase when we're reading this to our kiddos. Like, I'm making, I'm making, uh, what's it called in English? Uh, soap berries, right? Yeah. Like I'm picking black seaweed, so my handprints are black. And so we're trying to always keep that in our minds. Like, what is it that we're doing that's culturally relevant with our children? <laughs> right now, we're in a box. We're in a classroom, right? We have a, a fenced-in area where we can go outside and play. But really, one of our goals is to get our kids out on the land more often and try to really bring that place-based piece in for our children or bring them out to that place. These are just some small examples of, of what we've um, made. So I think um, I'm gonna move into just some video to show you guys some of the activities that we do. You know, I know a lot of us learn like songs that go to tunes that are familiar from our childhood, right? Non-indigenous tunes like the Itsy Bitsy Spider or Cuddly Itchy Kutrayan or Elizabeth Paradovich was a, right? Wonderful, amazing teaching tools, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to get away from that and creating music and songs that are more relevant to who we are as a people. So this is a, this first song that I'm going to do is a song that I created to help kids greet each other by moiety, right? So the eagles are going to sing to the ravens, the ravens are going to sing to the eagles, and they're just saying, like, we're so glad, you know, thank you for coming here, we're so glad you are with us today, okay? And we're going to test the sound, make sure it doesn't echo. So the eagles, sorry, the eagles have just um, greeted the ravens and told them they're thankful to have them there. Now it's the ravens' turn. Yeah, so this is, this is during our circle time routine, and um, the next song that we're gonna do is Tsuha Kakewa'a. So how many of you guys know, like, Yake Tsutat, Yake Sitka-san, Yake Hana? Those are great phrases, but they're also translating our English language, what we're used to saying in English, like, good morning, good afternoon, um, and that's not how we would have greeted each other a long time ago. One of the phrases that we often s would say is tsuhakakewa'a or hakakewa'a. 
And that just means like it, it has dawned on us again, right? The daylight has broken on us again. And so this song actually came to me when um, my third child was a baby and she would wake up from naps. And it wasn't always morning, so I couldn't always say a kid to taught. And it wasn't always afternoon, right? I had to like think of a song I could sing to her. And so this one is Tsuhaka Kewa'a. Super fun stuff. This group of kids in particular, um, just phenomenal like language. I'll talk about this later again, but you can see a difference when the language is in the home as well, or when the resources that we send home end up on the walls and our guides for the parents. You can see a difference in the students that come to school. They can see that the language is valued in their home um, and their, their language was phenomenal. This is an activity, this is a little bit of a slower activity, so I'll just tell you guys. So this is an activity that goes with the Jin E. Te book, the one about the handprints. And this is just teaching colors. And so I'm asking the students to go and get something that is a specific color in a classroom. And the reason I started doing this activity is because we realized that 20 minutes to a half an hour of them doing literacy block was a long time for them to sit. And so we started integrating movement into the literacy block. I think you guys can get the picture, you know, of what's going on there. They're just each getting a turn to go out into the classroom. And then years ago, we did this uh, training called Conscious Discipline. And, you know, learning about how important it is to have some kind of physical contact with the, the children that you're working with but also allowing it to be their choice and on their terms. And so this is an activity um, that we do with the kiddos. We give them four options, like when they're leaving circle time. So adusak edena, who's sitting well, and the kids who are sitting well can come up and they can pick their choice of how they wanna leave the circle and what kind of um, physical contact they would like to have with me. It's the wheel. I'll explain it, how about? So we have four choices for them. 
and one is Achsenachushi, hug me. So the kids who choose to hug you can hug you. The other one is Achjinguash or Achjinguash, right? You're gonna pound hands. Uh, one is Achjin Talk Touch. They can give you a high five. And then um, we have a really fun one. It's called Wush Katu Dashi Hakiji, and it means let our wings touch. And so we face each other and we let our wings touch and we make ho, 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 raven noises together. Um, and so that's a really fun um, way to have the students exit, but also to encourage positive behavior, right? Circle time is so hard for three to five year olds. It is so hard for them to sit for that long. And sometimes we're like, okay, we're just gonna get this done really quick. But then they have to also sit at the end and wait their turn to come up. And so they know there's that positive reinforcement. And so we make sure to give every student, even if they're having a hard time sitting still, I'll say, thank you for trying right? Because we're not going to talk negatively about their behavior. We're going to talk about how they actually tried. Um, so that's one way to get them moving. Okay. Now we're going to talk about, I know we're going to have time for questions at the end of this, but I wanted to give uh, some time to this because I think I'm going to be blunt. Our systems, our, they are not working for our children. Our sister systems within like districts, classrooms, when they are our parameters, you can and you cannot do this. It's not working. Um, it's not working for our children. It's not working for our programs. Um, and I'm not saying the nest is working um, to its full capacity either. We're not there yet. Um, but I feel like we need to move in a positive direction. I think we need to think about what are realistic expectations, what are ways that we can get, either create the system that's gonna work for us or help to change the systems that we're already in. And so we constantly change our program and it might be frustrating, um, especially for parents who are like, hey, we did year one, now we're jumping into year two and we're like, well, our hours have changed, the days of the week have changed. But I'll give an example. A couple years ago, it was the year we were coming back from COVID, we were like, okay, we're gonna do two days a week, but to meet the parents' needs, we're gonna do 10 hour days. That will still get us our required 500 hours in a year by the, you know, by the end of May. So we're gonna try that. And it worked great for the parents because they could drop off at 7.30 and they could pick up at 5 or 5.30, right? That was great. But what we found was if we had staff out, then we were working 10-hour days on those days. Not only were we working 10-hour days on those days, we were doing 10 hours in a language we are not completely proficient in. It also meant that our children in the program were doing 10-hour days. It's only two days a week, but 10 hours in a language that a lot of them have never even heard in their life. Um, and so like the following year, we're like, okay, we, we can't do that again. That wasn't fair to the kids and it wasn't fair to us as staff. And again, we didn't have as much staff then as we do now. So the following year, last school year, we switched it to be three days a week and you could drop off as early as 7.30, but pickup was at three. And we had, um, we had a, a bit of pushback from the parents and I had to sit down with a few of them because they're like, we don't work those hours. And I just had to let them know, like if we want this program to be successful, if we want this program to survive, we have to try to do what's best for the program. And I think that's been like a battle in itself for us to try to meet the needs of the kids, try to meet the needs of, of the staff, try to meet the needs of the parents, try to meet the needs of the grant requirements and try to meet the needs of the program. And I think what we've come down to is we have to do what's right for the program because we've seen nests start and we've seen nests close. And you know, it was devastating for me to watch some of the language nests in our state close because I was like, wow, th those were our role models. What's gonna happen to us if they can't make it, right? 
And so we had to make that expectation that we're going to do what's best for the program. And that means preschool hours, three days a week, because we don't have a curriculum. We are not 100% proficient in our language or even close to 100% proficient in our language. So we still have to keep up with our learning as well as their learning. Like we have to stay ahead of these kids because I tell you what, they learn really, really fast. They learn really fast and I'm gonna provide you some really fun examples. Um, another expectation, a realistic expectation, like if you're gonna go in this direction of doing this kind of work, and I know like a lot of us work within organizations, if you can, when you can, contract out the work. And so in the past, my team was teaching and then every other week we were hosting family nights and we were cooking for those family nights and we were prepping lessons to teach the family's language on those family nights. And it was, it just became to the point where it was like, well, the priority isn't for us to teach the language. So it's not turning out as well. We're not prepared as much as we'd like to be. And again, when COVID hit, we were just like, okay, we're gonna hand this off. We contracted somebody, they ran language classes over Zoom for us. And it was just one more thing taken off of our shoulders because those of you who are language warriors know that it is heavy, heavy, heavy work and there are not enough of us doing the work. Might not even be enough of us to find contractors to help you do the work. But that's one of the things that I would suggest is when you can get contractors or some, you know, if you have the monies to bring contractors in or more staff, people might look at my team right now and be like, wow, why do you have so many staff, you know, and you have almost as many staff as you do kids. And I'm going to say, because we need it, <laughs> because we need it. Um, right. I talked about curriculum writing, language learning for us age range of students one year well for like that first month that we opened in 2019 and then that following school year we had 14 students and we had uh, age ranges three to ten three to nine years old we found out that doesn't work right we have seven eight nine year olds who are bickering with each other because they're coming after school they're fighting with each other there's a whole bunch of the older girl drama that's happening, um, which is taking time right away from the language instruction of the little kids. Um, so I would definitely say like, set your age ranges accordingly, that it can be like age appropriate. I think if we had two separate programs, you know, maybe an after school program for the older kids and they came in sometimes and they paired up with our younger kids and they role modeled, but all day with with the mixture of the age ranges didn't, didn't really work for us. And then again, I, I already talked about the capacity of the staff, right? Um, you know, we're having to be closed for the next two days at the nest because we're short on staff because um, some of us are traveling and some of us are sick. So there's just that whole capacity issue all the time. So observations, understandings, and wins. Uh, I'll show you a video in a minute. Um, the amount of language that they retain, even over summer break, and again, a lot of these students have parents at home trying to learn the language actively, using the language with them. The retention is amazing. Um, two years ago, or it was right when we came back from COVID, I walked you know, we're in not even a week in school. And I'm like eating lunch with the kids and I have this kid look at me and he says, and he's like, that's enough of you eating. And I was like, oh, where did you, like, how did you, okay. I, first of all, I was like, well, that's probably how we talk to the kids. Maybe we should change the way we're talking to the kids. <laughs> and then secondly, I was like, he just put, Deowe and Icha and my name together in a sentence correctly, phenomenal, right? Like it was just amazing. Um, okay, I had, um, this is where I'm gonna talk a little bit about receptive versus expressive language. I had some folks last year come in and they were from the Yukon. They did some observations in October in our classroom. 
And I'm like, well, don't expect a lot of language. Like, it's gonna be chaos. The first three months in a language nest every single year are really, really hard. I'm just gonna put that out there. They're really hard. The kids have language barriers, which then um, induce uh, behavior issues, right? There's just so much you're working with. I mean, in any classroom, the first few weeks are hard, but like in a nest, it's like months of being really difficult. So they came, they observed, they were like, wow, this is really cool. There's language, there's like no English on the walls, or there's in all these books, there's no English in these books. And then they came back in May, and they were like, after they observed for a couple of days, they said, it's so like, when do the kids start speaking the language? And I was like, well, they do sometimes in here. Um, but I was like, I had to explain to them the difference between receptive language and expressive language. So like, imagine a baby baby, right? Maybe they're coming into toddler age, almost two. They're not talking a whole lot, but I bet if you said, hold my hand, that baby would reach up and hold your hand, right? I bet that if you said, hey, come here, you know, I gotta change your diaper, they might run away from you because they don't want their diaper changed or they might actually come to you. That's receptive language. That's language that that child understands. Are they going to be able to say it? Probably not yet, right? But they are understanding and so there's a big difference. Expressive language is when you have the kid, they're two, three, like my two-year-old is a crazy good talker. She is something else and she just like, she'll go on and on. I opened the shed door at my work the other day and she walked in and she went, oh, fantastic. I was like, what? You know, expressive language. She's able to verbalize and tell us and express herself through language. And so I was explaining that to these guys and I gave them a lot of examples, some of the examples I'll give you here in a minute of the difference of when we can see where the students are at. You know, some people say, well, can I see your assessments? Like, what do you use for assessments? And I say, this clipboard right here, it says expressive language, receptive language, and we write down all the examples throughout the school year and that's what we type up and we give to the parents like this is what we notice with your child that gives us a gauge it's more of an informal assessment i'm not marking numbers i'm not saying oh they got three points on this one and one point on this one we're just observing what they can understand and what they can say and so that's what i told these folks i said you have to think about these three to five year olds they're they're baby, baby, babies in the language. Like I'm still probably like, I, you know, maybe second grade, if that, I still can't even function in the language as well as a second grade can in, in a school in English, right? You have to think about these are little, little babies. And so we have expectations of them. When they're done eating at the table, we ha they ask us, can I leave the table? In, in the language. If they want milk or water, they're gonna ask us in the language. And that happens within the first couple weeks. If they wanna come in from recess, they ask us in the language. So we set expectations that we know that they can do. Even if they're like, it was 11, Mahina. You know, go ahead, try. Just try, you know, that's what I tell them. Just kinda up, just try. And a lot of times it will be mumbling or maybe they'll just be like, I want some more heen or I want soup heen. You know, they're using that one word at least, right? And so I'm going to go through some big wins and I'll tell you guys like about that in a minute. Um, again, I've talked about parent involvement in the home, but also like we are a program, a program that the, the focus is language, right? Our language nest. So the parents are flexible. A lot of times parents who I think would jump into the opportunity of putting their children in a nest, they just can't. They can't put their kids in our nest because we don't run full days. They get off work at five, they can't, you know. Last year we did after school care for a couple of families, which made, you know, we were working overtime and we finally got permission to be like, okay, as your friend, can I bring your child to your, the other daycare so that, you know, we don't have to stay after and work 10 hour days. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility from parents. The families have to be invested um, in the program for, you know, for a lot of different reasons. 
Um, I have parents who check in all the time, like, how's my son doing? How's my daughter doing? And we can just text back and forth. We text with parents all the time. Um, just that open communication, talking about challenges and wins. We send them videos of their kiddos. So again, we're not just in there to teach language. We're forming the minds of young children, uh, which is kind of a scary concept when you really think about it. <laughs> So I already shared with you guys the day away ichadachini. That's enough of you eating now. Um, I would say my son has, when he was three, four, you know, he was pretty little too. I think he was two when COVID hit. So we were at home a lot. I used a lot of language with him, prepping him for the nest, just really using a lot of language. So by the time he got to the nest, he was already switching out verb roots. Um, he was making jokes in the language. So, for example, he says, well, okay, how do you say I love you infinity? And so I taught him, like, I love you forever, okay? But then one day he walked up to me and he's all, which means like, I love you nothing. Like, I don't love you, basically. I mean, he's putting sentences together, but he's like making funny jokes or he'll be like, I love you 100. So he's learning how to switch those out. And even prior to that, I was like, oh, it means I love you. And he says, right? It's not the proper use of that verb, but he was basically taking the love verb root, he switched it out with chun, which means stinky, right? So like making jokes in our language, switching out verb roots, we never taught him like, no, chun is the verb root and chun is the other verb root. And, you know, he just was doing that. And that happens with our kiddos all the time. Um, this one, the ha de nagu. So this is the kid who also told me de away ha. He, we found in, you know, communication with the parents also showed us that like at home, he, if he spoke in Tlingit, then he basically got what he wanted, right? So he's like, well, and he's laying in bed, and his mom's like, well, he asked me for goldfish in Tlingit, so I'm going to bring it to him, even though it's bedtime, right? Like, he just was really using the language a lot. And one day, he was really bossing me around. And I should have made a chart for this, but he said, ha de nagu dachjini. Now, okay, I'm going to try to explain this. Ha is like here, right? Like ha du a gut, he came here, okay? De means towards, and nagu means to walk. We don't say ha de nagu. We say ha gu. I've never in my life heard somebody say ha de nagu. But somehow he took that locative suffix, the directionals and a verb phrase, and he put them together in a full longer sentence than what we say. That blew my mind. He took pieces that we've never used together and he put them together. And it was technically correct, even though we would say ha gu, right? You could say hot gu, which is basically ha de nagu. It's the same, it's the same thing, just phenomenal. Um, this, these couple of things connect with, uh, when I say they can come back after a summer and they've got language in them, like hastutu, hastutu It's amazing. Cause the other day, um, one of our students was like, oh yeah, you know, I want water or whatever. And we're all thinking, and he said, that really means like, I want to eat it. He used the wrong verb, but he just blurted out a whole sentence, like, I want to eat it. He's putting subordinative phrases together. Really phenomenal. And then later that day, he was like playing with his plate, and he dropped it. And he's all, Doc Woodsy Git. That means like it fell. And I was like, Das away, Doc Woodsy Git. He's like, well, my plate just did. I was like, what? You know, just like. I can't tell you how mind blowing it is to like watch these kids learn, retain, and use the language. Um, we have like the 
what we call clingish kids using it, right? They're like, hey, I'm kachucking, I'm packing it up. Basically, I'm cleaning, but they're using English, the ing and the I am, um, or like, I want sukin, different phrases like that. I have one girl who last year I told her, oh, has to in kananik, kagach to chalk. I said, go tell them. We're gonna, we're gonna clean up. And she just looked at me and she stood like this. I already told them, Dalchini. Receptive language, right? She didn't tell me and think it like, de has to in kahuanik, but she knew what I told her to do and she's like, I already did that. Receptive language. They might not be speaking it, but they know. Like, at the beginning of the year, I often am like, they'll come out of the bathroom and I'm like, oh, did they wash their hands, right? And I'll say, did you wash your hands? Sometimes, especially our returning students, they'll walk back into the bathroom and they'll wash their hands. Receptive language. Sometimes they'll walk back into the bathroom and flush the toilet. And I'm like, okay, they didn't know what I was saying at all. That's my cue, right? I need to work on that phrase. They don't have that receptive language piece yet. So I need to work on that so that they understand. Although the verb to flush is the same verb, like wash it south. So, you know, maybe they, maybe they do have an idea of what I'm saying. Um, we had one little girl last year up until winter break. She was so shy. She was like devastating for her to be in the nest. And it was like all of a sudden after winter break, she came back and I texted her mom and I was like, what happened? Because she was like loud and engaged and making friends and just like, just like this new person. She's like, I don't know. It just happened. Like over winter break, something changed in her. And so like when we have the kids go around and say, Kajin winit uyach, there's five minutes left. Kajin winit uyach. She's the kid who's like, ah, and she just yells. We didn't teach her that. She just started doing that. She still does it. She still shouts it out like all loud and proud, like, yes, okay, I know. And she just, it's amazing to see that. Okay, like the student who has blown my mind the most, he's now, you know, I think he's in second, first grade. He's just amazing. One time I was, he was the kid I had to lay with at nap time. Like I had to lay with him every single day at nap. Maybe he slept, maybe he didn't. And I was wearing this floral dress. It had flowers all over it, colorful. And he's laying there and he's three and he's like, He's pointing at the colors and he's singing the colors. He's sing, he created, he's saying it all in Tlingit. It's, you know, and so then we created like, well, he created the song, but now I do a, a scarf activity where the kids dance to that song. And I get to tell the kids like a child who was three years old created this song. Like it's, we, it feels like maybe it takes a little bit of pressure off of us, you know, like those of us who are doing it. Cause these future generations of kids are just, they're phenomenal. Um, I think that we are probably out of time. Uh, I'll show you one other quick video before we move to question and answer. Um, this was like the first week of school. We're using real blueberry juice. This is just an example of, um, I'm hoping this will work, of how much retention. Again, a parent who speaks the language at home, but still the retention was incredible. Right? Like, boom, I didn't, I didn't try to encourage her to count those. Yes, we had been counting a little bit during circle time, but she just, boom, she was just counting all the way up to, I don't even know, seven or eight. Really amazing um, stuff. These kids, their minds are just phenomenal. I was all like, oh my gosh, this presentation is 10 minutes long, <laughs> or I mean an hour long. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And now look, we've hit the hour mark. So. Questions? Any questions in the audience? There was somebody came in online. 
so I can uh, start with those. Gunnar Chish, for the work you're doing in Hayuk Atarni Kudi. What are some key themes of words you are teaching? Do you have like a top 100 list of words, key phrases, or questions? Any, and can you share that with families not in the program, perhaps with Head Start or another organization? Um, we have started that document probably several times. It's probably pushed off to the wayside a few times. Um, yeah, I. You know, one of the things about us working in the nest is that what we create, we share. And so we do create like a, uh, a folder that says PDF files for sharing. Um, obviously, you can't be reproducing or doing anything like that. But if you're using them for educational purposes, like we can share that folder out. Again, it's been kind of pushed to the wayside because we just are doing so many other things. But um, if you want, um, access to any resources for educational purposes, feel free to reach out. Okay, there's one more online right now. What achievements are you look, uh, hoping to see the Nest make in the next five years, and what challenges come with it? How does the community and organizations help overcome those challenges? Um, in the next five years, I would like to see a toddler room. We debate. Sometimes we debate whether we move to a kindergarten room next so that our kids can continue on with us or whether we do a toddler room. Um, I feel like a toddler room, like could you imagine if the kids had it for 18 months with us before they entered preschool, how much language they would already have and then we could really focus in on content. So that's a, definitely a goal of moving in one direction or another. Um, yeah, I would like to see the program grow um, in, the, in one direction or another in the next five years. And what way can organizations um, help with that? Um, I have seen growth within our organizations over the past probably three years in the level of collaboration with each other. And I, I guess the one thing that I ask is that we just keep moving in that direction. Uh, you mentioned that um, you heard of other nests um, you know, that, that closed or didn't make it. Um, how many other uh, language nests are there and are there others here in Southeast? Um, I know in the 90s there was a language nest. I don't know if it was 100% language immersion in the 90s. Um, and I think that was probably grant funded through Clink and Haida as well. Um, bit different than what we're doing now. Um, there is Kunsi Nai in Heidelberg, which is a Khodkil um, language nest. Um, that is run through the school, I believe, in Heidelberg, um, with Goyang being the lead teacher, uh, Ben Young. And then there was a language nest in Yakutat for a few years. Um, man, they had like 20 students. It was. It was amazing. It was really cool. Um, and I don't know of any other ones. Um, you know, I talked to Larry Kimura. Uh, he's what they call like the godfather of the Hawaiian language, right? He was one of the key people in, in, in the language revitalization efforts in Hawaii. And I was like, so how many people do you talk to that want to start language nests? And he's like, lots, like all over the US, lots. And I said, how many of them succeed? And it was kind of dismal, right? It was it was discouraging, um, but I think I think when we work within certain systems that are limiting and they have walls and boxes, um, one of like one of the ways that I think our team works really hard at trying to break down those walls is just we don't have a, a major micromanagement happening of our program. Our supervisors trust that what we are doing is best for the program. Um, we are flexible with each other, right? We make sure that we take care of each other when we need to be taken care of. 
And I think that's just one of the ways where we're, we're saying, okay, we're not in this box right now. We're, you know, we are a unique uh, program and working for a unique organization and we have that flexibility and that ability to do what needs to be done for the success of our program. Um, I've seen it in my son. He's definitely done some uh, grandparent correcting, um, for sure. You know, the funny thing about that is, like, I remember my mom years ago. She's like, I'm never going to learn the language. I can't learn the language. It's just like she just blocked it off. She's like, nope, not doing it. But then she had to because we didn't use English for a lot of things in our home. And so pretty soon she's talking about to honey as breast milk and a itcha for a bottle and a tukta ut and like pretty soon she's using all these words and my son would definitely correct her and um and her papa or his papa for like when they would try to use the language so yeah i definitely see it i don't see it necessarily with our students outside i do hear stories of our students who've gone into tcll of them you know correcting or helping and, and being role models to some of the younger students and things like that. So yeah, it's pretty fun. Any other questions, comments? I'm just curious. Um, so in the video where uh, the students were singing Eagles to Ravens or Ravens to Eagles, um, it seemed to say, Assuming you've just made an inclusive environment where you know somebody is not a member of a clan, you know, how, I was just curious how you handled that. You know, um, Great. You know, fully so far, we haven't had any children who weren't a member of a clan, or that their, you know, maybe their mom is not indigenous, but their father is. So they're obviously going to be the opposite of their father. Um, but we have had uh, a number of. Um, Haida students and so you know we've had some confusion on are they eagle or raven like one of our students was like an eagle for a year and then a raven for a year and we we're like okay we're figuring this out as we go um, we also have had kids without names right without indigenous names and so last year for the first time ever we just did a small little thing in our classroom so like uh, I have a student whose yuchtun name means like rising tides, and so we asked an elder, like, how do you say that in Tlingit? And then we just gave her the name, Dakana Dane, right? And we put money on her forehead in front of the class, and we gave the money to a uh, witness from the other clan who was a student as well. And we did that with another student just to bring that inclusivity in, in for those students. My favorite part of it, what you are doing yeah, um, is that you are helping these children to grow up where it's normal to use Shingit. It's normal to know your, your moiety. It's normal to know these things. Um, I, I work in language usually with adults. And one of the biggest problems that people have is not being able to make our unique sounds almost like they're afraid of it or, or it, it, uh, it's uncomfortable, it's, it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a huge problem and I understand why we're like that as adults because of what we experience. But when I witness what you all are doing, it really gives me a lot of hope. It really excites me to to know that there's this whole batch of indigenous people who are, that there are going to be barriers removed. Uh, it, it gives a lot of hope. Okay. Kumchish. One of my students, actually, his mom was chatting with me and she's like, 
uh, he just realized this is the end of his kindergarten year. And she said, he just realized that not everybody speaks Tlingit. <laughs> like, it's pretty fun when they have those realizations of like, oh, wow, this isn't just everywhere, you know, that they think that it is. And that's so cool. Yeah, Chish. I really appreciate the work you're doing too for your language. Good to Chish. Miss Cheese, Josh Ginny with uh, Heartwarming. Good cheese. And our next lecture will be uh, Thursday, September 21st, with Shago, Alfie Price on the Juno Sonogonic uh, Sim Channel Group Twitter group. Thank you. Yay.